We rejoined Ben, Gwen, and Kevin at a local park. The afternoon sun casts a cozy topaz light, though unfortunately not everything can be idyllic, as from up in a tree, Ben hears a cry for help. Seeing a young boy trapped on a branch, Ben takes it upon himself to rescue the child, transforming into Wild Mutt and scaling the tree, before telling the boy he's here to get him down. However, in a voice that carries an all too familiar sepulchral rasp, the child snarls that he doesn't want to get down, he wants to get out. Then as his eyes, or rather I, fall upon our young hero, Ben sees that it is the pitch black sclera and pinkish purple iris of Ghost Freak. Waking with a yell, Ben soon finds himself tumbling from his bunk, a fact which elicits worry from his family and a chuckle of smooth move Tennyson from Kevin. All the same, he does ask if his buddy's okay, with Ben relaying the events of his nightmare, though in a comforting voice, Grandpa Max assures him that this is all it was, a nightmare. Nonetheless, Ben remains on edge for the rest of the morning, being too perturbed to even pick on Gwen when she tells him they're going to be spending the day touring a prestigious school called Bancroft Academy that she hopes to enroll in when summer's over. This uneasiness persists even even when they arrive at Bancroft, with Kevin telling his buddy to chill out since it looks like he's seen a ghost. Though this is not too far from the truth, as while they continue the tour of the campus, Ben repeatedly thinks he sees or hears Ghost Freak, albeit fleetingly. Thankfully, a distraction soon comes in the form of the Circus Freaks, though to Ben's chagrin when he attempts to transform into Heat Blast, he becomes Ghost Freak instead. But this is not the end of the strange turn of events, as Ghost Freak then delivers an uncharacteristically cruel beating to the trio, with Gwen going so far as to call Ben out for it, though to her surprise when Ghost Freak meets her eye, it is to declare that he is not Ben at all. However, before the orange-haired heroine can question this, the Omnitrix begins to time out, with Ghost Freak screaming that he won't go back as he flees, leaving Gwen, Kevin, and Grandpa Max bewildered. Over with Ben, he has finally become himself again, much to his relief. Though as he looks up, he sees that he is not alone, coming face to face with Ghost Freak. Shocked, Ben calls this impossible, but Ghost Freak claims there's an ectoneurite, his consciousness exists even in a single strand of DNA, meaning he has been trapped inside the Omnitrix, but now he is finally free. He then sheds his outer covering, revealing a far more intimidating true form, as he declares that in order to regain his full power, he requires the Omnitrix, which means he has to possess Ben. The sinister spectre then lunges at the boy, but instinctively he leaps back, coming into the open and subsequently halting Ghost Freak, whose skin smokes upon contact with sunlight, forcing him to retreat. Taking this as his chance, Ben flees back to the others, informing them of what has happened, and while at first they are skeptical, an Omnitrix alien coming to life would hardly be the strangest thing they've seen, with them all agreeing to help Ben look for his rogue transformation. Thanks to Grandpa Max's plumber tech, they're not entirely in the dark, though it is still nightfall before they find anything of note. That being the circus freaks up to their old tricks again in spite of their injuries. At first Ben is frustrated, thinking this is just a distraction, though this all changes when Ghost Freak emerges out of acid breath, revealing not only that they have teamed up, but that his possession powers are all too real. Desperately, Ben attempts to fight the ghost as forearms, though this is entirely unsuccessful, as with his intangibility powers, Ghost Freak avoids the blows and attempts to fulfill his plan by merging with Ben. However, to everyone's surprise, it seems that Ghost Freak cannot possess Ben in his alien forms, with the spectre calling this a setback, but not a major one, as he need only wait for the Omnitrix to time out again. That is until Max reveals his sun gun, with the radiant beam being enough to damage Ghost Freak until he takes up residence in another of the Circus Freak's bodies. This quickly becomes the way of things, with Ghost Freak hopping between his trio of minions as he uses their powers to try and wear Ben down so that when he times out, he will be too weak to resist. Wanting to help, Kevin tries to coat himself in the stone pavement, though like last time, it struggles to come. Thinking back on when he did it in the fight against Technorg, he realised that he wasn't trying to force it like he is now, and instead it just happened when he wasn't putting up any resistance. Maybe that's the problem. He's always been guarded, always had walls since he's needed them to survive on his own, but while energy can pass through walls, solid stuff like matter can't. Maybe he's got to let the walls down if he wants to make full use of his powers, kind of like how he had to let them down to become part of the team. As if it had been waiting for this epiphany, the stone beneath Kevin's fingers suddenly springs up, coating his skin and giving him a greyish complexion. However, this is not the only change, as when he swings his rocky fisted acid breath's jaw, the resulting impact is far greater than he could have managed on his own, stunning the freak. Though Ben is a bit tied up fighting a ghost freak possessed Frightwig, he does at least give his pal a quick thumbs up with one of his spare set of arms. Unfortunately, this gives ghost freak an idea, as he declares that maybe the key to defeating Ben is not the most powerful body, but instead the one closest to his heart like his best friend, perhaps. 
frantically, Ben, Gwen and Max all call out to Kevin, urging him to move, but it is already too late, as with a maniacal cackle, Ghost Trick vacates Frightwig's body and makes a beeline for Kevin. In a last ditch effort to save the boy, Max opens fire with his sun gun, but Ghost Freak is too mobile, weaving in midair to avoid the shots and slamming headfirst into Kevin's chest. Letting out a grunt, the young Osmosian stumbles backwards, though when he opens his eyes, they are still his own and not Ghost Freak's. Briefly, everyone wonders why, until with a hiss, the pernicious poltergeist is forcibly ejected from Kevin's body, at which point Gwen surmises that maybe it's like with Ben's aliens, where Ghost Freak can't possess Kevin when he's coated himself in something. However, this is not the only benefit, as in his dazed state, Ghost Freak is an easy target for Grandpa Max's sun gun, with the ectoneurite letting out a haunting shriek as he is caught up in the ray and disintegrated. With Ghost Freaks seemingly gone forever, it is a simple matter to round up the Circus Freaks and hold them until the police arrive. Though before Team Tennyson can leave Bancroft Academy, there is one more matter that must be dealt with, and that is between Kevin and Ben. Having not missed what Ghost Freaks said about their relationship, Kevin tauntingly asks if Ben really considers him his best friend. Wanting to keep something of a cool facade, Ben attempts to protest, blustering and stammering, though this is quickly brought to a halt when Kevin pats him on the back, grinning that for what it's worth, he thinks Tennyson's alright too. The next stop for our heroes is none other than Texas, after Grandpa Max gets in the light about an ancient Mayan artifact called the Mask of Arpuk. Apparently, this mask is the key to finding an even rarer object, called the Sword of Ectua, which supposedly has the power to destroy whole cities with a single swing. Naturally, Kevin thinks this is awesome, imagining how useful it would be for fighting bad guys, as well as the money they could make if they sold it. However, in an uncharacteristically brusque manner, Max shuts this down, stating they won't use it or sell it, they just have to find it to keep it out of the hands of those who would misuse its power. Taking off a top speed, Team Tennyson soon find themselves outside an old storage facility, with Max stating that the mask is located somewhere inside. He then tells Kevin to help him out, since according to Ben, the boy was able to break into a warehouse back in New York. Grinning, Kevin responds that it would be his pleasure, coating his hand in metal from the doorknob, then punching a hole just below, so he can reach in and open the basement door from inside. Frowning slightly, Gwen comments that she's pretty sure what Kevin just did is illegal, though with a shrug, Kevin retorts if they really didn't want anyone getting in, they would have bought a sturdier door. Heading inside, the group are soon able to locate the room where the mask is stored, though to their dismay they are not alone, as a trio of men wearing metal faceplates and chainmail enter shortly after them, declaring they will be taking the mask. Scowling, Max informs the kids that these guys are the Forever Knights, sort of anti-plumbers who steal alien technology for their own benefit, with the Forever Knight leader, a man in a golden mask who calls himself Enoch, leering that Max forgot to add they are also the future rulers of the world. He then has his men draw their swords on the team, telling them this is their last chance to hand over the mask, but seeing how much this means to Grandpa Max, Ben jeers that it's not gonna happen, turning into Wild Mutt and barreling into the knights. When the two subordinates are down, Ben gestures for the others to hop on his back, though when Max and Kevin leap on, Gwen finds herself with nowhere to sit. Having no time to find creative solutions, Ben takes matters into his own hands, or rather, mouth, as with a grunt, he grabs hold of the back of Gwen's shirt with his teeth and hoists her into the air while charging back towards the exit. Seeing as how they're fleeing through enclosed corridors, this is not a particularly pleasant ride for anyone. Though Gwen is especially vocal in her displeasure, seeing that if this shirt gets stained with wild mutt slobber, Ben will pay. Nonetheless, Team Tennyson make it all the way back to the rust bucket in one piece, and since they still have the mask in their possession, they are the ones to take the lead, while the Forever Knights follow in hot pursuit. Thankfully, Max has a solution for this, deploying caltrops which shred the knight's tires, preventing the need for the afterburners, and thus keeping the rust bucket from breaking down. With the RV still or functional, the team are able to continue into Mexico unabated, though this does not mean they are free of problems, as not only do they lack the knowledge of how to use the mask to find the sword, but there is also a serious morale problem brewing as the kids grow to resent Max's stern, taciturn demeanour. However, in a strange quirk of fate, one problem solves the other, as while the kids are hanging out in the bedroom area bemoaning their situation, Kevin attempts to mock Max's obsession with the mask by putting it on. This results in the image of the temple being projected into the air in front of him, and when Gwen and Ben finally manage to get their grandpa's attention, Attention, he declares that must be where the sword is, taking off at top speed. Unfortunately, even travelling by car, our heroes arrive at the temple after the Forever Knights, though to their relief, they find that the knights have still not been able to breach the perimeter. Using the mask once again, Ben is able to locate a secret entrance, and so sneaking inside, Team Tennyson once more find themselves in the lead. Now that they are so close to the prize, Max's obsession only grows, with him expressing more concern for the safety of the mask than Ben when the boy almost falls to his death and then again growing impatient with the kids when they trigger a hidden rock trap that almost crushes them all. However, the biggest tell comes when the Forever Knights ambush the team, taking Ben, Gwen and Kevin hostage, as Enoch gives Max a choice, the mask or the children's lives. 
Naturally, Max hands over the mask, though for the briefest of moments, he hesitates, a fact which is not lost on Kevin as he lays his hand upon his captor's armor and coats himself in metal. Having no knowledge of Kevin's powers, the knight is defenseless against the headbutt that follows, and as his comrade holding Ben and Gwen attempts to aid him, Ben is at last able to reach his Omnitrix, transforming into Diamond Head and clobbering him too. This just leaves Enoch, though when Max goes to retrieve the mask from him, Kevin intercepts him, using his well-honed thieving hands to snatch the mask up first. Tersely, Max tells the boy to give it to him now, but with a scowl, Kevin refuses, saying that ever since they started this little quest, Max has been a real jerk, breaking and entering, stealing stuff, and not caring about anything except himself and what he wants. In short, he's been acting just like him before he joined up with the Tennysons, and a guy like that doesn't deserve the mask or the sword. Scowling now too, Max growls that Kevin's... <sighs> absolutely right. He doesn't know what came over him, though he does know one thing. In order to make sure nothing like this happens again, there's only one course of action. He then grabs one of the downed Forever Knight weapons and drives it into the mask, turning it to dust and declaring that with it gone, the sword will be safe forever. Refusing to accept that he is lost, Enoch frantically attempts to force the door of the inner sanctum open without the mask, though this proves just as fruitless as attempts to breach the main entry, and so seeing no need to stick around, the heroes depart, all the while the gold-faced knight curses their names and vows vengeance. Next up for our heroes is Camp Fear, though at least during the early stages of this episode there is little difference Kevin could make as the driving conflict is the friction between Ben and Gwen inherent to their relationship. As a result, they still encounter Gilbert and head to the camp, with Max going to investigate and Ben following suit to find his grandpa when the old man does not return. This leaves Kevin with Gwen and the campers, with him choosing to stay behind since with Ben gone, he's currently the only one with powers. Thanks to this decision, Gwen's group does have a slightly easier time, as displaying the qualities of a leader, Kevin keeps the younger kids calm and focused, allowing Gwen as the brains of the operation to come up with strategies that keep them all safe. Safe. As a result, things mostly go like in canon, albeit with less strife. And though she doesn't say it, Gwen is impressed. Maybe that scruffy dweeb is good for something after all. Meanwhile, in the den of the mycelium, Ben's adventure goes just like in canon, with him still unlocking Wildvine and beating the fungal invader with the athlete's foot powder. Likewise, the beginning of Tough Luck stays mostly the same, with the only key difference being that part of Gwen's drive to visit the Magic Expo is motivated by her desire to have powers like the boys. However, things begin to change when Gwen gets her hands on the Keystone of Bazel, as while Ben is mostly unfazed, having no craving for backup as he's had Kevin watching his back for a while now, Kevin is happy for the girl, thinking it's awesome to have another superpower ally for fights. This belief is put to the test a few hours later, when Hex and Charmcaster bust into the Magician of the Year Expo, as when Ben as Wild Mutt goes to confront them, Gwen and Kevin join in. Using her Keystone Enhanced Karate, Gwen proves a capable opponent for Charmcaster, while Kevin, now coated in concrete from the floor, goes to work fighting her rock dogs. This leaves Wild Mutt free to confront Hex directly, and without Charmcaster to assist him, when Wild Mutt pins him, he stays down, allowing security to arrive and arrest the Warlock. Seeing a chance to get everything she wants at once, Charmcaster changes tack, calling off her dogs and seeming to do a complete personality 180, as she thanks the team for saving her, explaining she doesn't want to be bad really, she's just scared of her uncle Hex, and so is forced to go along with this scheme, but now that he's out of the picture, she can stop doing evil stuff, and maybe start to make amends for her mistakes. Having seen the power of redemption firsthand through Kevin, the Tennysons are quick to accept this, with Kevin himself even suggesting that she join them, since her magic would be a great addition to the team. Though truthfully, his motive in that moment less to do with the team, and more to do with having a chance to spend time with a pretty girl. Still playing innocent, Charmcaster jumps at the opportunity, giving each of them a hug, then promising to meet them at the RV after she's collected her stuff. Clearly smitten now, Kevin offers to help, but with a smile the sorceress declines, heading off and leaving the boy a little disheartened. This is not lost on Ben and Gwen, who waste no time in teasing their aloof companion for his crush, to the point where Gwen does not notice the keystone has been removed from her bracelet until they are back at the rust bucket. Feeling like an idiot, Gwen blames herself, though to their credit, the boys attempt to comfort her in their own ways, with Ben saying even without the keystone she can still be a hero, while more pragmatically Kevin tells her to feel sorry for herself later, since right now they've got a psycho witch to stop. Heading to the highest point in the city like Charmcaster had told them, the team find her attempting to recreate the charms of Bazel alone, 
having deemed her uncle unnecessary for the ritual after his pathetic showing against Ben. Both taking personal offence at her betrayal, Kevin and Gwen confront the sorceress together, with Kevin coating himself in metal, while Gwen shows off all the strength she has gained even without the charms. Meanwhile, Ben provides a supporting role for once, using his hoverboard to sneak up behind Charmcaster and swipe the keystone, taunting that she's not the only one who can play dirty. Angrily, the witch attempts to send a swarm of rock bats after the boy, but being faster, Kevin snatches her bag, while Gwen delivers a flying kick that knocks Charmcaster prone, and just like that, the spell is broken, with the eclipse passing uneventfully, and Charmcaster being arrested just like her uncle when Max arrives a few moments later with the cops. As she is led away, Gwen sticks her tongue out at the older girl mockingly, though Kevin's reaction is more subdued, telling her that she could have been a great part of their team, and this time it is clear that his disappointment is entirely altruistic. When she is gone, Ben touches down beside his cousin and hands her the keystone, smiling that he believes this belongs to her. Looking stunned, Gwen says she thought he said she didn't need this to be a hero. Though still grinning, Ben replies that she doesn't, but as he's come to realise, a little extra help never hurt. Beaming broadly now, Gwen comments that's probably the nicest thing Ben's ever said to her, before slotting the keystone back into her bracelet and declaring Lucky Girl is here to stay. Following their trip to Vegas, the next stop on the Tennyson roadmap is none other than the Bermuda Triangle, as Max's old friend Donovan Grantsmith invites him and the kids to visit his underwater resort before it's even open to the public. Donovan's grandson Edwin is also present, and he takes an immediate dislike to Kevin, judging him on his scruffy punk aesthetic and rough demeanour, and deeming him to be riffraff. Predictably, the feeling is mutual, as Kevin quickly comes to regard Edwin as a stuck-up preppy poser when he begins to brag about an exclusive sumo slammer pin he got from an event in Helsinki. Edwin is also aloof to both Ben and Gwen, with the pair coming to share their friend's assessment of the rich boy, though when Donovan instructs his grandson to give the kids a tour, he seemingly expresses some desire to impress the cousins by showing them his grandfather's prized possession, a submarine known as the Undersea Manta Ray. When he offers them a joyride in the sub, the pair are happy to accept, with even Kevin begrudging admitting this is pretty cool as he inspects the advanced systems. Descending deeper and deeper, the four kids bear witness to rare marine life, likely not seen for hundreds of thousands of years, though this is not the only feature of note, as seemingly out of nowhere, a mechanical squid latches onto the viewport right in front of Gwen. Suddenly the undersea manta ray is swarmed by these creatures, and though Edwin attempts to pilot them out of harm's way, the squids are persistent, chasing them down and attempting to breach the cockpit. Knowing they won't survive long at this rate, Ben sneaks away to become ripped jaws, and as he begins tearing into the cyber squids, Kevin tells Edwin to move over so that he can drive. Angrily, Edwin demands to know why he should, calling the manta ray a delicate piece of machinery. Though with a fierce glint to his eyes, Kevin snaps back that he may not have the other boy's fancy education, but he's got experience getting away from people who want to kill him. So unless Edwin can say the same, it's time he move. Conceding this point, Edwin climbs out of the pilot's seat, allowing Kevin to strap himself in. Then when he is in position, the scruffy boy pushes the thrusters into overdrive. At once the undersea manta ray lurches forward, and thanks to Ben fighting off the robots, the sub is actually able to gain some ground, or rather, water, on their pursuers. This sudden burst of speed presses the trio hard into their seats, though this is hardly a concern for Kevin, who laughs hysterically, calling this a rush, while from her own seat, Gwen complains that he's enjoying this more than he should be. All complaints aside, thanks to Kevin's daredevil piloting, the manta ray is able to escape almost undamaged, with Ben rejoining them just in time to re-enter the resort. Unfortunately, this is not the safe haven our heroes might have hoped for, as it seems the squids have already breached the protective glass with the intent to flood the entire complex. Resentfully, Edwin declares that this is all his grandfather's fault, saying he never should have taken that alien power source, and though Donovan tries to argue, the boy stands firm, forcing him to relent and accept his mistake. He then explains the true story of how he powers this place, with everyone surmising that these cyber squids must simply be trying to get it back. However, now is hardly the time for recrimination, as with the waters rising, Donovan makes the call to evacuate, resulting in everyone clambering aboard a small craft and heading for the surface. Unfortunately, it seems the aliens not content to let the ones who wronged them go, as before they can fully make their escape, a few of the squids attack the craft, splitting it in half and sending the kids crashing back down into the flooding resort. Thinking fast, Ben transforms into Gax to save them from a painful impact, grabbing the others in his arms and leaping from the wreckage of the ride moments before it's crushed flatter than a tin can. This does come at the cost of Edwin learning Ben's secret identity, though with a rare smile, the rich boy teases that he'd have to be blind not to connect Ben to the helpful aliens that have suddenly started turning up just when the brunette is absent. Now that they are safe, or at least not in imminent danger, the next step is to get to the energy core. Here Gwen suggests they sneak through the pipe,
types. And while this is all well and good for herself, Edwin and Kevin, Gax quickly finds that he exceeds the size limit. Thankfully, he is an alternate mode of transport. As testing a hunch, Ben finds that this alien is well equipped for swimming, though just how much so comes as a surprise when he instinctively becomes a giant octopus once he submerges himself in water. Using this to his advantage, Ben is not only able to traverse the water but destroy any cyber squids he comes across, allowing Kevin, Gwen and Edwin to make it to the energy core without issue. Here they are met by Ben, and after a brief discussion decide to reconfigure the core to self-destruct, taking the resort and the squids with it. The only question is how the four of them will avoid sharing the resort's fate, though here Kevin has an idea, telling Gwen and Edwin to climb onto Ben's head, since there should be just enough room for them all to hang on, and if Ben can get them to the undersea manta ray, he can pilot them back to the surface. Gulping, Ben says he's not sure he'd be fast enough with passengers to get them there before the core goes boom, but seeing as how there aren't any other options, he tries anyway. However, as it happens, it's not speed that Ben should be concerned about, but timing. As midway into their trip, the Omnitrix symbol begins to flash and beep, signaling the start of the timeout sequence. Knowing they won't make it if he times out here, Ben redoubles his speed, with the manta ray coming into sight. Desperately, he pushes forward, and just as the final beep sounds, he tosses his friends, with all of them landing on the sub. Pulling him up after them, the kids get in, with Kevin revving up the engine and smashing through one of the remaining windows, as behind them, the resort explodes. A few moments later, the undersea manta ray breaks the surface, and as the two worried grandfathers run to embrace the kids, they all begin to laugh with pure amazement at their miraculous escape. Finally, when the children are able to move again, Edwin approaches Kevin, sticking out a hand to shake and apologizing for being a snob before. Shrugging it off, Kevin says it's no biggie, though Edwin insists that it is, undoing his sumo slammer's pin and giving it to Kevin, stating that this is thanks for saving them all. Jealously, Ben whines that it was his alien that saved them, but with a hint of his old smugness, Edwin retorts that it was Kevin's plan that allowed him to do what he did, making him the real hero. Laughing heartily at this, Kevin slings an arm around Ben's shoulder, telling him not to take it too hard, since he can't be the one to save the day every time. Following this are the events of Dr. Animo and the Mutant Ray, or rather, they would be if not for Kevin, as when Ben starts messing with the Omnitrix and trying to jam a screwdriver beneath the faceplate, the young ruffian is quick to curb this behaviour with a swift smack to the back of Ben's head. Angrily, the brunette demands to know what that was for, but with a scowl, Kevin tells Ben that he has to treat a piece of tech like he treats a woman. Poking her head into view, Gwen asks how so, a frown forming on her face. Though unfortunately, she never gets her answer, as Kevin declines to continue, sensing he's made a mistake of some kind. However, one thing that was certainly not a mistake was discouraging Ben, as the next morning when Dr. Animo turns up at Gatorfest, Ben is able to utilize the Omnitrix unimpeded, transforming into forearms and clobbering both him and his mutant frog. As a result, the not-so-good doctor soon finds himself in police custody once more, while Team Tennyson are able to enjoy the rest of Gatorfest in peace. Though Kevin does request that if the family have any other freaky enemies from before he joined the crew to tell him now, since after the circus freaks and Animo, he doesn't want any more surprises. For obvious reasons, back with a vengeance is skipped entirely, with this also meaning that Ben does not unlock Master Control, since with Kevin around to keep him company, he doesn't get bored enough to fiddle with the Omnitrix, resulting in unlimited power remaining beyond his grasp, at least for now. Likewise, the events of Midnight Madness go more or less the same as canon, except that Kevin is also there to help keep Ben awake with some mild torment alongside Gwen. Subsequently, when Subliminal uses his giant watch to brainwash the shoppers of the Mega Molopolis, Kevin is among those who are caught in his trance, looting and even attacking Ben, until the the young hero is able to thwart the hypnotist as Wildvine. A few days after this, Team Tennyson hit a milestone, that being Max's 60th birthday. Like in canon, an argument quickly breaks out between Ben and Gwen about who should have gotten Max's cake, though this time Kevin is here, and to everyone's surprise, he sides with Gwen, saying that Ben can just become Accelerate, so he should really stop being a baby and go get it. However, before a verdict can be reached, something draws the kid's eyes, that being a mysterious glowing portal which materializes right in front of them. Suddenly, a flying figure bursts from the portal, and before anyone can react, they grab Gwen and retreat. Worriedly, Kevin yells that they've got to go after her, but Ben is already one step ahead of his buddy, transforming into Accelerate and giving chase once Kevin is on his back. Leaping through the portal, the pair soon find themselves in some sort of alien city, or at least they assume it is, until they see a statue bearing the inscription, Ben 10,000, Hero of Heroes. Looking at each other, the boys ask what's going on, though to their surprise, their answer comes from none other than Gwen's kidnapper, as she approaches them, with Gwen by her side, and explains that this is their 
their future. She then reveals herself to be an adult version of Gwen, introducing herself as Gwendolyn, and explaining that she knew the quickest way to get Ben and Kevin to follow her would be to grab Gwen. Furrowing his brow, Ben asks why exactly Gwendolyn wanted them to follow her, with the older Gwen beginning to say that she needs their help, though before she can say what with, a rhinoceros villain appears, destroying the statue and declaring his intention to kill Ben, mistaking him for his future counterpart due to him still being Accelerate. Thankfully, Ben 10,000 does arrive a moment later and promptly defeats the villain, though when he sees who Gwendolyn has with her, his face hardens into a fierce scowl. Furiously, he orders his cousin to take them back to their own time, but remaining resolute, Gwendolyn refuses, saying they're here for a very important reason. Unfortunately, any hope of an explanation is swiftly cut off as Kevin speaks up, eagerly asking if he can meet his future self too, reasoning that if they're both superheroes, then he must be as well. If looks could kill, Kevin would be dead a hundred times over from the glare Ben 10,000 gives him in response to that question. Though even still, he does not address the boy directly, instead looking back to Gwendolyn and in a cold tone instructing her to show him. Looking a bit shocked at this callousness, Gwendolyn goes to protest, but in a tone that will brook no argument, Ben 10,000 tells her to show him, or he will. Seeing that this is a fight she cannot win, Gwendolyn summons another portal, ushering the kids through it, all the while hanging her head slightly. Stepping through, the kids suddenly find themselves in a graveyard, and as Gwendolyn follows, she directs them to the headstone right in front of them. Written on it are three words, Kevin, Ethan, Levin, along with the death date which the kids recognise as only six years in their future. Shocked at the idea that he is going to die at the age of 17, Kevin is at a loss for words, though in contrast, Ben cannot keep quiet, demanding that his future cousin tell him what happened so they can avoid it. Who killed Kevin? Was it one of their current enemies, or someone they'll meet later on? However, at this question, Question, Gwendolyn lets out a deep sigh, then slowly lifting her eyes to face the trio, she explains that the one who will kill Kevin is Ben. And that's where we'll leave things for now. Thank you so much for listening, I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave your thoughts, suggestions, or screams of rage in the comments below.